Welcome to the American College of Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the front line, Surgeons Voices. With me today is a friend and former SAGES president, Dr. Brian Duncan. Dr. Duncan is now the Chief Medical Officer for Boston Scientific Endoscopy. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Steve. Nice to be here. Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Of course, I haven't seen many people in a while other than on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> one day we'll get back to in-person meetings. I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. But for the moment, at least we can chat about your role as chief medical officer. Perhaps a starting point for us might be, what was your involvement uh, with industry prior to this time that got you interested in this type of a role? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And I think it's one that um, kind of illustrates uh, what the relationship is between healthcare professionals, surgeons in particular, or proceduralists and in, in, uh, in industry. Um, my background's in biomedical engineering. I think that's what attracted me to kind of leveraging technology to take care of patients and, and in pursuing a, a practice that uh, used minimally invasive surgery and flexible endoscopy. And because I lived in that world, I've, I've collaborated with industry, lots of different industry partners over the years on, on a whole variety of levels. That can be on, you know, improvement of devices and giving feedback. That can be on support for research of my own. Um, and then as uh, many people know, I've, I've had a real passion about education, particularly educating, uh, practicing surgeons and clinicians on how to stay abreast of the field and adopt new techniques and new technology. Uh, and industry has been a very important partner for doing that too. So I've, I have a long history of collaborating with, with multiple companies, including the one I eventually went to work for. So in your surgical practice, you, you um, did a lot for SAGES and other organizations, but, but perhaps not everybody knows as much about it. And, and although you touched upon it, what are some of the things you did in surgical practice? Where were you and, and what your, were your roles prior to going to Boston Scientific? Yeah, so I've I've had a f uh, I've been in academic surgery my uh, entire career. Uh, I've had a few different stops um, along the way. The last of which was at the Houston Methodist Hospital in in Houston, Texas. I was a professor of surgery there, uh, general surgeon, and my background um, was really in minimally invasive surgery. Almost anything there is to do in the abdomen using minimally invasive techniques, and that focus shifted as my my career matured. Um, and then also uh, therapeutic endoscopy and, and really on the forefront of that, a little bit of an unusual uh, practice in that I do ERCP and all kinds of advanced therapeutic endoscopy and did that uh, really from the early days, from the 90s. Um, and, and, and so um, kind of crossed those worlds of working both laparoscopically and endoscopically. Well, being at the Cleveland Clinic with, with Jeff Ponsky, I'm, I'm well used to that world, uh, but I also understand what you say it, it's not necessarily ubiquitous throughout the world of surgery yeah so yeah getting more so though and that, that was part of my impetus for making the move that i did well so tell us about the move that you made now you're in this role as, as chief medical officer what are the responsibilities uh, in that role what are some of the things you have to do on, on a daily basis or, or even in terms of long-term planning yeah, so that's one thing that um, I think most people don't know what a chief medical officer is uh, typically. Uh, part of that is that there's a lot of variability. So that, that title can mean different things in different organizations. Uh, even within my own organization, we have six divisions. Each division has their own chief medical officer. And um, the role that that person plays in their division varies uh, a bit from division to division. In, in my world, I, I wear a number of hats. So uh, well, one of the things I do is I'm part of the leadership for, uh, for my division. And so that really is around um, setting strategy and, uh, and where you're gonna go. Um, I think the easiest way to understand that is my role in that regard is to be the voice of the physician and the patient in the room. Um, and that's really where I bring value. Like, what is that perspective? What should we be thinking about? Where are the blind spots for the organization? As we horizon scan, where should we be going? Those kinds of things. Um, I have a role to play around uh, research and development and kind of portfolio. So what are we working on? Where are we going? Where do we see the opportunities? 
Um, I also have, I have a couple of teams that report directly to me. Um, one of the things that I've been really impressed about in joining an organization that uh, services uh, thousands and thousands of patients around the world, uh, we're in over you know, 130 countries, uh, there is a very big difference between being kind of a smaller startup, making a small volume of devices or even prototypes and trying to get those through the regulatory and approval process. There's a, the difference between that and being a big multinational organization that makes millions of devices. My division alone touches 22 patients a minute and, um, and making sure that that is done in a way that every time you open that package, that that device works the way it's supposed to. And so we have a huge quality and safety infrastructure uh, that really monitors the performance of every device around the world. Uh, and that safety team, uh, the medical safety team rolls up to me. So I have a responsibility around looking at those complaints, understanding the patient impact, and then making sure that I'm part of the solution within the organization so that hopefully that never happens again. Uh, and then professional education is the other uh, huge part of what I do. And uh, that's been a really exciting opportunity. You know, if you think about it, um, medical device companies are quite good at, at partnering with, uh, with surgeons and docs and coming up with good ideas. They're then often very good at the engineering and kind of the science of turning those ideas into products um, and then getting those out to the world through the regulatory process. But if we don't start leveraging the science of education, which is, which is a science, and it's a science that's matured every bit, every bit as much as you know, the science of medicine, the science of engineering, if we don't start leveraging that process, then um, we can quickly overwhelm the healthcare community with the things that we bring to it. And they can't adopt it safely and effectively into practice and bring it to our patients. Um, so we're working very hard at bringing that science of education uh, within our walls so that we can develop efficient and effective training pathways that allow people to adopt technology safely into practice and get it to patients. Um, so that's, uh, it's a lot of hats. It's actually what I like about it. I also kind of serve as the face of the organizations at a professional community, uh, which, is, which is a huge fun part about it. It's real privilege to be able to travel the world spend time in different ORs and endoscopy suites, learn from experts, see what they do and, and kind of bring that back to the organization. Excellent, thanks very much, that's very enlightening. So, so two questions, the first is about you personally, uh, you mentioned interfacing in the operating room and the endoscopy suites, have you maintained privileges anywhere? So you continue to do any clinical work or, or is it just uh, based upon what you're seeing at, at present as you travel around? Of course, you've got decades of experience anyway. I'm just curious if you've kept at it. Yeah, no, I, I, so I've been with the company uh, just for around two years. Um, I've taken a bit of a pause in clinical practice, uh, although I'm getting back to it. And, and so I'm working through uh, licensure in my state right now. And, and uh, I have friends in, in uh, in departments of surgery in the in the city here, and so uh, plan to get back to that. I think it's uh, uh, I miss it. I think it's important uh, that I had to work with the company to make sure that you know that was going to work. But it uh, keeps you relevant, keeps your fingers on the pulse of what's going on. And as you said, I've got decades of experience. I'd sure hate to throw that away uh, um, completely. So I'm I'm looking forward to get back into a, into a part time practice. Well, good. You'll be an asset to whichever hospitals uh, sign you up, certainly. And, and I'm glad you say that because it, it does provide a valuable interface for the company and for those of us in clinical practice that you're actually working on both sides, uh, simultaneously working on both sides. The other question relates to education because you spoke about traveling the world and going in ORs and endoscopy units, but obviously in the midst of the pandemic, there's a whole lot less of that type of activity going on. But what you're doing where you, you're talking about interventional techniques, how translatable is education in that realm to what we're doing today and having video-based education? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's one that uh, we've been working hard on because um, you know it's different being a surgeon or an endoscopist, right? You, you, you can't just read about something and, and then go do it for the first time on, on one of your patients. You really need to get hands-on experience hopefully rehearsal in some type of simulated environment before you go to the real environment. Um, what 
what we have done is we've leveraged an efficiency. So if you think about it, many of us have gone to courses to learn some new technique or new technology, and you fly in somewhere, maybe stay for a day or two or more. Um, and if you look at what the actual activity is, often much of it is, is kind of knowledge-based, right? You're in a, in a lecture hall or an auditorium, uh, you're, you're watching presentations and, and hearing from experts. All of that can be done in the way that we're doing this now. And in fact, it can be done even better if we host that on a learning management system, augment it with um, kind of more than PowerPoint type presentations, put in assessments of knowledge along the way and, and, and make it available to you anywhere on your phone, on your iPad, you can look at it between cases and progress through it at your own pace. So the knowledge part, we've done a very good job of being able to do that uh, over distance, self-paced uh, and that kind of thing. The hands-on part's still needed. And, and what we've done is we've created a distributed model in some of the things that we've wanted to train on where um, we've created a robust train the trainer program that has allowed us to put trainers into the communities uh, that we want to serve so that if you want to learn something and you need hands-on experience, you don't have to get on a plane, you don't have to stay in a hotel room, uh, you can go to a local conference room essentially or simulation lab uh, and have an experience there and that experience has been pared down to just the hands-on component that's required uh, because we've already taken care of the knowledge part before you ever got there. Uh, so I think it um, you know, there have been some silver linings in COVID. I think telemedicine is one of those, us getting very proficient at, at communicating like we are now. And this distributed model is going to stay. It's a very efficient way uh, to get uh, hands-on practice really right out to the clinician without taking them away from their busy practice and their family. Yeah, the only thing we're missing are frequent fire miles. <laughs> there's always going to be that coming together, though. There is there is a real joy in the camaraderie of coming together and being around others and learning. So I don't I don't think we'll ever take that away. No, no, I, I hope not. I'm being facetious. Um, yeah. But um, just to wrap up, any any parting thoughts you might have for uh, aspiring surgeons who are intrigued by what you have to say or what they've seen or heard in the past and, and thinking of, of working more with industry and any advice or counsel as, as to how to go about it? Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I would encourage it. You know, um, one of the things that I really enjoy about the company that I work for and, and really with um, all of the medical device companies that I've worked for is that um, the ones that do it well are completely patient focused, just like we are uh, in our practices. And they feel that responsibility, um, but they don't know what we know. And so they, they need that collaboration uh, with surgeons in order to do their jobs well. Uh, I tell people, look, I don't make this stuff in my garage. We need to collaborate with it. And likewise, they didn't go to medical school and residency and fellowship. And so there has to be that collaboration. I think it's very special uh, when it comes to surgery and medical devices. So engage in that. It can be done responsibly and transparently and well, and it should be. Um, and um, if you're wondering how to do that, just talk to your local device uh, representative. They'll, they'll get you down the road. Uh, they'll engage you. Uh, they know how to do that, and they know the right people to do it. Um, and if you want to do it all the way to, you know, uh, join an organization like I have, um, that's a tremendous honor, too. I mean, if you think about it, as a clinician, we serve a patient at a time, and that's very special and, and unique, and, and, uh, and it's a privilege to be able to do that. Uh, I've talked about doing education and research. That kind of expands that. That's a magnifying effect. Uh, but as I said, I'm now part of an organization that serves 27 patients a minute. Uh, that's, that's a pretty big magnifying effect as well. So I hope that if I do this job well, uh, that can have a real impact on the healthcare community worldwide. Well, thanks very much for your time, Brian, and, and thanks for all you're doing for us and our, and, and our patients. I, I wish you sustained good health and hope that we do see each other in person in the not too distant future. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been fun.